Hello, and welcome to the Bloodstream Podcast, a show serving the greater bleeding disorders community brought to you by Believe Limited and Bloodstream Media and made possible thanks to our presenting sponsor, Takeda. I am your patient, advocate, and host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am your healthcare advocate, nonprofit nerd, and that other host, Amy Board, reminding you to please speak with a healthcare professional before making any treatment decisions. On today's show, our first in 2022, the World Federation of Hemophilia President Cesar Garrido and Save One Life Executive Director Chris Bombardier join the show to provide some insights into the global bleeding disorders community at the start of the new year. There's also new information out on Biomarin's gene therapy clinical trial. That's just been released. Amy and I will touch on that. And the bleeding disorders community mourns the loss of a legend as previous NHF CEO and longtime community advocate Val Bias passed away on the final day of 2021. Those are the topics for today, Amy Board. But I have to say, before we get into any of that, it feels like the first day of school. I mean, I don't, when did, have we ever done this before? I don't know, honestly. Like, I feel we left 2021 being like, I, I, at least for me, I was like, I can do this yeah. in my sleep. Like, I don't yeah. need to prep. I don't need anything. And today, I'm a bit sluggish. So, it's I will strange. say the show, it's going to be a great show. We, we've got um, Caesar and Chris have really lovely things to say that I think will be really interesting. And yeah, they so do. it'll be And good. we recorded them previously. It would be a little bit different if we had if they were today. But for <laughs> us, the, of course, the audience won't know any of this, nor do we need to share any of this. We can Showbiz, just come on you all guys. confident and hey, da da Showbiz. <laughs> but that's not what we're about here. This is a community-based podcast. And the truth is, it's the new year, and we're just feeling our way into it. And not for nothing, but losing Val on the final day of 2021, for me, changed the start of 2022 in some pretty profound ways. So, you know, oh, I wanna exercise more? Like that, (laughs) I cared less about that January 1st and January 2nd, uh, and still care less about that than I had intended to. Um, (laughs) We chatted just before we came on and um, Amy and I both have personal experiences with Val and there have been a lot of wonderful tributes. I would like us to to give ours as well here through Bloodstream. We've also been fortunate at Believe Limited to have recorded with him for many hours over the last decade for many different projects. So next week, I think we're going to re-release, or actually release for the first time, some of that material that has not yet made it into a Bloodstream podcast episode, a Powering Through panel, one of our documentaries or so on, and release it here uh, so that you can connect with Val in his own words and and maybe hear some things about his life and from him that you didn't know. And we'll use that opportunity as well, Amy and I will, to share uh, a bit more about our feelings on the matter as that was quite a, quite a earth-shattering way to yeah. wrap up 2021. Yes, um, 100%. I, I think... Um, I can speak for many folks in the community, whether you are affected or not, have been influenced by Val in some way. Um, and so to have it come on so sudden, I think was was really difficult to have it, um, you know, come on when he has um, retreated from, you know, community view for a while, I think was, was difficult to not mm-hmm. get a final say or a final word. Um, so the... The thought of um, releasing some of the, you know, wonderful storytelling, and you know, he he was um, he he was one of my favorite speakers, you know, of all time. I mean, he he just he was really wonderful. I think will be a treat to honor him, to honor his legacy, because if you know, and I, I think we could take the entire show to talk about his legacy. I'm getting goosebumps right now, but um, yeah. truly, I I it's it's hard for me to think of another member in our community right now. Um, who has done more and, um, you know, I think embodied, you know, what this community is about more than, more than Val Bias. I miss him. I miss him as a, as a person and a friend. (laughs) I don't think, it doesn't seem real yet. Like I, I, and I think because of the pandemic and how spread out we've all been, um, it just doesn't feel real. Like I, I, I can't, I doesn't, I don't believe that I'm not going to hear his laugh. Yeah. Yeah. 
But anyway, so we'll do, we'll get into that a bit more. There are so many lovely tributes out there, as uh, I think I mentioned earlier. So if you are inclined and are, are looking to connect in that way, um, do poke around online, Val Bias, and check the social media platforms you use. Um, put something into Google, NHF. Uh, WFH, other organizations, many, many other organizations have posted statements. Many people have posted statements. We'll aggregate the uh, various tributes that are out there for him. Those will be in the program notes so that there'll be a little bit of a one-stop shop where if, again, you're looking to connect with that kind of material, you can get it in one spot. So that'll be coming out next Friday on the 21st. Um, Okay, I feel a little bit like a stand-up comic who comes out and first insults the audience before going into the rest of their show, where you're like, hey, I'm going to dig a giant I hole, know. and then we'll do a show. But, know. you know, sometimes in life. So here's the other thing that we've got to, well, we got to do a few things. I got to make sure that everybody uh, remembers or is made aware of for the first time, if this is your first episode and you blanked on when I mentioned it in the opening. I got to let you know that the Bloodstream podcast, it's made possible by our presenting sponsor, Takeda. Yes, Takeda, that's right. Takeda, they have this website, bleedingdisorders.com, where you can learn all about Takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. It's good when those things go hand in hand. Takeda believes in a world free of bleeds, which we support, and are dedicated more than ever in their efforts to offer a wide range of programs and support to help patients throughout their treatment journey, wherever on that journey they may be. And I have to say, I believe that. Also, my first phone call of the of 2022 Monday morning, bright and early, was with someone from Takeda. It was about, amongst other things, this podcast and confirming they're continuing to support this podcast in 2022. So, you know, we didn't do a whole bunch of like, next season, if we have one, like we didn't really do that. But of course, you know, there's nothing's guaranteed. So uh, we are having another season. We're here. You're listening to us. It's happening in real time. But in that call, I'll tell you, I did not expect to get nearly as much information as I did about Takeda's resources for and commitment to the bleeding disorders community. Uh, (laughs) They are dedicated more than ever in an effort to offer a wide range of programs and support. I believe it. I got a firsthand dumping of it. It's true. And you can learn more about it by visiting bleedingdisorders.com. One more time, grab a pen if you need it. You shouldn't, but if you need it, bleedingdisorders.com. And And I just want to remind everybody that (laughs) we want to thank you personally. I know Takeda as well, but thank you for listening. And remember to hit that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, Episodes can be listened to and shared directly from the Bloodstream Media Facebook page as well, which is a very cool thing. And as always, if you've got suggestions or or guests or different topics, um, if you have any questions, obviously, for Patrick and myself, you can ping us on social media or you can email us at mailbag at Bloodstream Media com, And we always say that, and it's always true, but especially right now, start of the year, you know, we're preparing for hopefully a year that's going to involve us being able to get out there and be in person at conferences and not just do the, the virtual hallway conversation for the BDC. The, you know, we want to do the actual at the place conversations this year. So while we're doing all of this planning, um, it's a good time to get ideas and suggestions in. So again, mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or ping Amy, ping me where you can find us on the socials. Uh, thank you for listening. As Amy said, Takeda, thank you for your ongoing support. Uh, we couldn't do this without all of you. So, okay, the Biomarin data, Amy, I'm going to bring that up just briefly to say uh, a couple of days ago, it was announced that they had more information. It was year two of their phase three trial, uh, which in total has 134 patients. Um, and, and Patrick, they, uh, just in case people don't know, a trial for what? What are they doing? <laughs> Biomarin has an investigational product for gene therapy for hemophilia A uh, called Valrox. So you'll start hearing Valrox said a little bit more. So the Valrox gene therapy trial in hemophilia, as longtime listeners and community members may recall, it was, I don't know, 18 months ago, Amy, something yeah. like that, where we yeah. were expecting, um, well, we were anticipating the FDA's response to Biomarin's application for Valrox to be a commercially available gene therapy product based on all data, including their phase three data thus far. The, as I recall, the number one 
uh, directive from the FDA was we need more phase three data. We need more data on this phase. So this that's why this year two phase three data is a point of emphasis. And this was just announced a couple of days ago. Uh, neither Amy and I are doctors or medical experts. Um, so I want to be careful by about presenting this without an expert on hand, which is why we'll do the deeper dive of this in a couple of weeks with an expert. And then the other thing, and this is one I'm, actually personally even more interested in, and I saw a couple of doctors on social um, commenting about this. Um, There is some pretty heavy steroid use that is involved in this process. And again, you've heard Luke Pembroke, if you're a longtime listener, come on this podcast, talk about his gene therapy experience. And one of the things that stood out was the amount of immunosuppressants and steroid use that people are going through. And as one doctor um, put it, steroid use data is not revealed. It's very concerning to me if we willingly commit patients to it when alternatively, twice a month subcutaneous therapy is available, making the comparison there, of course, between Hemlibra and potentially a gene therapeutic that involves, as routine currently, heavy doses of steroids to people. And we're not, that data is not part of this. So with such heavy dosing of of steroids, how are we monitoring and following that? What are the safety protocols and guidelines? These are some of the questions that I have around that. So those are two big things that I thought were worth mentioning, at least in this top line. And then in a couple of weeks time, Amy will bring somebody on who can actually give us more of the the science and the so what of this new data. I think that's super interesting. Um, For listeners who maybe are curious about how you um, heard this or where you got your information, um, share a little bit about how you keep up to date on your your trial bits of info, your updates. Yeah, so, you know, you can use Google Alerts and you can get emails into your inbox when things like hemophilia and hemophilia and gene therapy or hemophilia and inhibitors, different combinations. So that's one way. Um, using hashtags across different social media platforms and then listing the results either by what's the latest or top results based on engagement. So I'll kind of look at what's something recently been discussed. But also, frankly, at this time, my timelines are so aggregated (laughs) with people from the community that once something comes out that people are sounding off on, I pretty quickly see the amplification of those stories before, like I never see the thing that gets published originally in, you know, Fierce Pharma or Biotech Today or whatever. But I will see when Brian O'Mahony from the Irish Hemophilia Society shares a link with a commentary that then gets shared out. So that's what I would say. You could set up, if you really want to be proactive and set things up like Google searches, that's not a bad idea. Um, Otherwise, I would recommend using social media platforms, hashtags, and finding the people on those platforms who are parts of this community patient advocates, medical professionals, scientists and researchers. There's different areas of expertise within the community and more and more of these professional experts are using social media to communicate, which is fantastic. Um, So I would say that. And then if all else fails or if you want to even kind of further simplify, uh, the National Hemophilia Foundation and the Hemophilia Federation of America do each have news departments and release articles and publish things and... Uh, share out meaningful things as they are published. They can sometimes be a little bit slower because they have to respond to things in a a way that's appropriate for those organizations. So what I may see on Twitter quickly and see a bunch of people from around the world commenting on might not be something that NHF has an official statement out about for a couple few days. So for me, at times, that's uh, a little bit of a, you know, my impatience (laughs) kicks in or something. But that's, you know, still doesn't mean it's any less credible. So those are my those are my guidances, Amy, as far as where can you go to find this kind of stuff as it's coming out. And I think that's good to, <clears throat> I'm sure there's some people uh, listening that have no desire to, you know, follow anybody on social media, you know, it just, that's like not their thing. And so to do yeah. a Google alert is, is perfect. Um, but they're, they are required to uh, release updates, um, you know, every now and again, especially with new data, especially around the big um, conferences, the clinical conferences. So just to keep that um, kind of in the back of your brain, listeners, um, caretakers and patients, that's a way to stay informed and engaged. 
as is following Bloodstream Media on different platforms or Amy For or I, sure. but you already we talk about it all. About all. That. That's so great. If you listen to this podcast in particular, you can be rest assured that Patrick James Lynch will talk about it. So don't even worry about it, y'all. And we'll bring in experts who can actually disseminate the information, which is, you know, lovely. So hats off to you, PJL and Bloodstream Media. Well, speaking of experts, we've got uh, two now that we'll hear from when it comes to getting a finger on the pulse of our global community and the needs globally. Uh, Again, Cesar Garrido, he is the president of the World Federation of Hemophilia. Chris Bombardier, who you've heard on this show before, the executive director of Save One Life. We'll now hear from each of those two individuals in our interview segments coming up right now. Caesar, welcome to the podcast. Uh, it's so lovely to meet you in person. I haven't met you in person. Um, tell us where you're recording from. Where are you? Where are you at? Where are you at? Okay, at the moment I am living in Caracas. So because it's my my home is here. Many people think that I must be living in Montreal or something like that. No, that is the headquarter of the WFH. But my home is in Caracas. I survivor in Caracas. So I try to, to visit that. Well, I hope next year will be possible to visit uh, some of the 147 countries. So great. And for our listeners who might not be familiar, what is your work with the WFH? What do you do? Well, my work is a volunteer. That is something that's important to let them know. And um, because all of the members of the WFH are volunteers, we don't have any kind of salary or, you know, compensation, something like that, except the staff member. There are approximately 63, 64 members of the staff. Uh, at the moment, I am the, the president, the current president of the World Federation. I have been working into the WFH my last 22 years as volunteers. So thinking about WFH um, and this past year, which was a challenging year, uh, what were some of your couple highlights? What were some highlights from 2021? Well, for 2021, the best moments have been when we have overcome transport obstacles, high shipping fees and permits in the countries where medicine have been arriving as part of our humanitarian aid. That has been a great challenge. Mm. Uh, as you know, the uh, the the war, of, the container war, or something like that. So, in many cases, has been a very very important obstacle. What did you learn about your role in particular at WFH and the community really over the past twelve months? The most remarkable thing has been to verify the professionalism of the WFH staff and the enormous uh, availability and solidarity of our volunteers, as I make a mention previously, uh, who all together have worked in a difficult year adapting to new schemes and sometimes working more hours from their homes than so they work in our offices. Mm. Uh, we are all determined that all people with living disorder have treatment. So that is that is our vision, really. Can you think, um, what was something that was surprisingly challenging or surprisingly difficult this year? Uh, Well, I I understood that we have a team with outstanding professional capacity and very useful tools to advance in the improvement of our hemophilia community, but that it was absolutely necessary for us to change patterns of the past. Mm-hmm. I was afraid that it will be it will be very difficult for me to break paradigms, and it turned out that all the parties involved were waiting for the opportunity to innovate, propose, and make change. My role has essentially been to support and lead all that thing that's innovating. So that that for me was a, a real learning. Mm-hmm. What are you most um, focused on here in the start of 2022? Could you repeat the question, please? Sure. What do you most focus on here at the beginning of 2022 for the organization? What's the organization focused on? 
Well, the, the focus for the next five years, not just to 2022, of course, is to have the, the possibility to visit our NMOs in on the ground because they are expecting that. Mm. Of course, the limitation and the and the of course the, the borders close. Uh, there are many borders closed. So uh, thanks to the our last strategy planning we, we did during the a month approximately, we have a strategy plan for the next five years. Uh, well I want I want to to see the the implementation of the plan is a wonderful plan, but I want to see on the ground that this plan it will work. It will, will be working. That's fantastic. And has the plan been um, stunted by COVID? Well, uh, it's not specific by COVID. It's more that a consequence of that by COVID. For example, it's it's demonstrated that the COVID is not affected specifically. To, to patient with hemophilia, but mm-hmm. obviously the COVID, uh, the consequence of the COVID uh, pandemic has been making uh, uh, to, to try to, to overcome even new concepts. The other point is, for example, that the new therapy, that of course, that is a challenge because our community or, or, or most of members of our community, they don't know exactly how to the to defend, to the argue, argue, to make arguments in front of the health authority of government with the new therapy. So that is that is the challenge. I hope in 2022 to to at least to start in on the ground. And for for me, on the ground, not no more virtual because it's not so effective like on the ground. Right. What's most exciting to you going into 2022? What are you most excited about? Well, of course, we are planning to celebrate our most important meeting. Uh, I mean, the, the World Congress, uh, the World Congress of the WFH 2022. So that it will, it will be the opportunity to, to interchange and to swap uh, concepts and information among us. We will uh, expect to have hybrid concert, uh, Congress. So it will be possible to to be on virtual at the same time at, at presence face to face. So well, we are we are planning that, and when we plan that, uh, a month later or two months later, uh, show up the the news variable that that Omicron about the COVID nineteen. So that is a really it's a moment. You, it's a comfortable moment, really. That's great. For our listeners and the bleeding disorder community, um, kind of thinking and, and wrapping up, um, what what would you have them um, kind of watch out for? What would you have them uh, look out for in terms of WFH's work going into next year? But something to keep an eye on. Well, for the WFH, of course, I told you we have to adapt many aspects our our process and our our work, our programs adapted to the new era. Okay. It's not just the COVID-19, it's for example that, that I make a mention, I made a mention about the, the new therapy, for example, but the 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 challenge is to to teach and to give training to the uh, animal leaders, I mean the leaders of the patient organization, uh, to make effective advocacy. So they have they have to to implement new strategy in order to convince the health authority. Um, and maybe the most important, at least the key is that they have to learn to work uh, and to make evidence uh, based on scientific evidence using data, using figures, using numbers. If not, they won't convince the health authority. The health authority are expecting to have numbers or something that uh, to prove to them that this therapy or this medicine or this strategy, it will it will be a benefit for the hemophilia community in that specific country. <laughs> well, Cesar, thank you so much for having us on. Is there anything else that you would like to say to our listeners uh, about WFH, about uh, the organization's mission and vision going into 2022? 
Well, I thank you for this opportunity. I would like to take advantage of this opportunity. I want to combine my optimism and my confidence in the work tool that we have. The human resources that we have, the group of volunteer experts hired by the WFA in the fields of research, training, and education are of the highest quality. I, I assure you that. Now it's only necessary that we all learn to handle the innovation that have arrived and those that are very close to appearing. And that is very good news, but uh, it also means a challenge. As president of the WFH, I assure you that we have very good news for our entire community in 2022. Will only the, be the beginning of the what is projected for the next four years. So it's not just for the next year. It's a, It's more than that. It's beyond the 2022. But at the moment, because you gave me the opportunity, 2022. Good, good news for 2022. Sounds like it. Thank you so much, Caesar. We hope to have you back on and uh, hear more updates. Thank you. And thank you to Caesar for that wonderful update on what we can look forward to here in 2022 from the World Federation of Hemophilia. And Chris Bombardier with Save One Life is up next. But hey, listeners, before that, I just wanted to um, mention that you can listen to a new episode of Flow, season two. Season two, episode one of Flow is now available. And we have a new co-host for you, Sarah Watson, who is a member of the bleeding disorder community and um, also a therapist and a sex therapist is going to join uh, Jessica Richmond on Flow for season two, and we're really excited. So make sure to check it out. You can find it Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and of course, bloodstreammedia.com. Let's uh, shoot it on over to Chris Bombardier and hear what's up with Save One Life. All right, joining us now from Massachusetts, three hours later, colder, darker than it is here in Southern California. <laughs> but he loves this anyway and wants to talk to us still. It's Chris Bombardier. It's hey, Chris. Chris Bombardier. Dear. How's it going? <laughs> good to see so you guys. Good. Right out of the gate, I have to ask about my favorite bombardiers, Jess and Carter. How are you doing? Fair. <laughs> <laughs> They're doing great. They're doing great. Uh, Carter's just wonderful. Um, he's just awesome. And Jess is doing awesome as well. Yeah, it's really cool. It's, it's, it's fun to have the new addition to the family. And yeah, it's been super fun. <laughs> How's being a dad influenced your perspective in your role at Save One Life? Man, I feel like being a dad's just changed my perspective on like everything. <laughs> mm-hmm. Just because uh, n- not everything, not that everything was about me, but you know the the perspective of just like you're taking care of this new human in the world, like, and it's this big responsibility. Uh, you know, it it kind of just helps you relate to a lot of other things in different ways. Um, I think I relate to the the struggles that parents of people with bleeding disorders have like Carter's health like health, healthy as far as like doesn't have any you know uh, chronic bleeding disorder uh, so um you know I think I relate a lot to to the struggle that a lot of these families have and especially now with the the, the families in developing countries I think just imagining having a child that has something that you can't do anything about um I just I just really relate to like how challenging that must be and like you do anything you can to help that child. So uh, I think that's given me a really interesting perspective. Um, and I wouldn't say that I didn't have that before, but now it's like very strong and powerful. Yeah, sure. I think that was a really interesting kind of development, I guess. So with that being said, Chris, what, what what's top of mind for you as the executive director of Save One Life uh, going, you know, here in 2022? Yeah. Uh, you know, I th- the biggest priority for us, I think, is getting back out to visit some of our partners um, mm-hmm. internationally, since the, the pandemic started, we really have been limited. Uh, we haven't traveled internationally at all since uh, 2020. So uh, getting back out and, and meeting our partners, kind of seeing how they're doing on the ground because COVID is still impacting them. Um, right. They're still struggling to get vaccines. They're still having lockdowns. Um, and just seeing how we can better service them and serve them and uh, see what their, yeah, see if their needs have changed since the last time we've been there. Um, so that'll be a big priority for us. Um, and then also getting out and seeing the community here in the U.S. to spread some awareness about what Save One Life does. Uh, I think that's been a real challenge uh, with this virtual world is getting, being able to meet people and uh, explain what we do. Uh, 
So actually, to that, to that point, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit from what I wanted to talk to you about next. But I, what, what do you think people and perhaps listeners of this podcast who are engaged in the community, you know, it's not their first rodeo, so to speak. But what do you think people don't know about Save One Life or might be surprised to learn or perhaps something that's changed about Save One Life that you haven't had the chance to get the message out about? What, what do you have to say to any of that? I think something that would be uh, surprising about to, to people about Save One Life is, first of all, we're a very small organization. You know, there's only five employees, uh, so we do a lot with five employees. But uh, our, we actually have quite a you know vast array of programs for being how small we are. So it's not just, I think a lot of people know about the child sponsorship program, and they know about Project Share, which donates Factor. Uh, but we also uh, have scholarship programs, helping uh, young adults go to school, better their education, have a better career, and programs to help small, small businesses. Um, or help people start small businesses, and we fund summer camps. So, like, we do a lot for a small organization, um, but it's really about that grassroots, like, one-on-one -on -one patient interaction that we're, we're hoping to just literally change one life, you know, hence save one life. So I think that's kind of an interesting part that I don't know if people know that we have all of these programs that really complement each other and really help build um, these patients, you know, help serve these patients and get them into a place where they can kind of uh, be independent and uh, take care of themselves, which is cool. Chris, from your perspective, how has the global bleeding disorder landscape shifted? I think in particular with with COVID. I mean, this was such a huge shift. How is it? How has it shifted? Yeah, you know, uh, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think my hope with COVID, uh, if there's any any bright spot that was going to come out of it, was that there would be more focus on healthcare in developing countries and, and, and building infrastructure and helping um, uh, people access care in developing countries. And, you know, my hope was at the beginning, you know, as the vaccines were starting to roll out and we saw the importance of getting those vaccines out that, uh, you know, more developed countries would be investing in that and hoping build those infrastructure. And unfortunately, it really just hasn't happened as much as we've I think I was hoping uh, to see. So mm -hmm. while that doesn't directly have you know, an impact on the bleeding disorder community. I think overall it does over time. You know, if, they, if that infrastructure is not there, you know, that's less access for people with bleeding disorders and, and um, you know, less uh, hopefully trained medical professionals that the bleeding disorder community could at some point um, connect with. So I think that's been a little disappointing, I guess, to see. Um, mm. But what's been interesting, I guess, bleeding disorder specific is, you know, a lot of countries have been trying to figure out how to do things differently to make sure their patients still had access during uh, the pandemic. So there's been a few countries that have actually been able to provide factor to patients at home. Uh, they used to have to come and get factor and they would, with this happening, they're like, well, we don't want you to be without completely. So they, they kind of distributed and rationed out their factor to patients. So they had something. Um, which is great. And hopefully yeah. that trend continues to have patients have some sort of access at home. So I guess that's a that's a pro from from this as well. Hmm. What do you think Save One Life's greatest challenge in 2022 is going to be? Yeah, I, I think there's, a, <laughs> that's a really great question. Um, I think the the biggest challenge in 2022 is is kind of still navigating how we best grow our organization. Um you know, we're small. It's hard to sometimes get our, the word out. Uh, um, but there's so many patients that deserve uh, our, our support and our help. Um, so it's just that how do we bring our voice back out into the space and meet, meet more of the community in the United States and tell them what we do? Like, how do we continue that mission? We've, we've done a lot through Bombardier Blood, um, which has been great. It's you know, brought a lot of cool opportunities, but there's still a lot of work we can still do with that. Um, so I think that's going to be a challenge, um, a continuing challenge. <laughs> you know, speaking of that little movie that we made about your life and all, <laughs> Bombardier Blood, available all over the place. Go to bombardierblood.com yep. right now. Um, <laughs> and I asked you earlier if there was anything about Save One Life you think people would be surprised to learn. Is there anything about you right now, Chris, personally, that people might be surprised to learn something to do with where you're at in your life at the moment? Um, I don't know if there'd be anything super surprising. Um, I'm This This is really nerdy but in showing we'll my age, that. I guess. Oh, no. Uh, I'm getting it. We got a new vacuum cleaner today, and I'm very excited oh, about that. <laughs> <laughs> and, Tell us and like, everything. That came, so that, came, a, that took a turn. Yeah, I didn't, I was not expecting, I was not expecting that. 
<laughs> well, now that we have a, 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 a young child that is becoming mobile, yeah. I've been noticing like he crawls places and he's like, comes up with like Ozzel hair all over him. And I'm like, <gasps> man, we need our vacuums old. It's not doing the job. And I'm super excited about it. <laughs> so I don't think people would oh maybe expect God. that I would be really pumped about vacuuming. So <laughs> I, I'm going to tweet this. I, I feel like this is the, this is tweetable. I don't know. 100%. I, I don't know. This is really exciting. Yeah, we'll work on the copy a little bit. But <laughs> the guy who got to the top of the world is thrilled about his new vacuum. That tells you everything Very you thrilled. need to know about aging, parenting, and I don't know, seasons of life. I feel like he crushed this question because the question was what's most surprising. And like, I was surprised. <laughs> and I am friends <laughs> with Chris Bombardier. Like, we text. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, I, was, I had to throw you guys off a little bit, you know. Oh man, it was very. It was. We're so proud. You, I was about to say, you're amazing. <laughs> how is your health? How's your hemophilia? How are you doing? Uh, I, I'm doing well. Um, I noticed during the, the, especially early in the pandemic, I was not taking care of myself as well as I should have. Um, just not exercising a lot, getting out. Uh, but I've gotten back into routine. I uh, actually ran my first half marathon. Uh, I guess it's been like two months ago, which has been really cool. Um, so yeah, just trying to find yes. new goals. Yeah, uh, finding new goals to get out and move my body and keep active. Um, yeah, so that's been good. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to like get back out in 2022 and meet the community again and see people. And I've missed, missed uh, the hemophilia family a lot. <laughs> And what about your yeah. adventurometer? Is the uh, the the vacuum which and, is a new word? Is that are you <laughs> still looking party searching for what's the next kind of big thing, or has that shift? Is that one of the many things that has shifted in significant ways since Carter entered the picture? Yeah, I think you know since Carter's entered the picture, I, I don't know if it's shifted a ton. I still have that that that. I don't know, that drive to go for, for adventure, I think maybe it's shifted a little bit. Like, I don't want to go for a two-month expedition at the moment because right. it's really cool being around Carter and seeing where how he grows and stuff. But uh, I've been reading a lot of books about Antarctica and explorers of Antarctica, and I still have that dream of, of skiing to the South Pole someday. Um, that's a very long expedition, but, like, that's still in my mind. Like, someday I'm going to do that. <laughs> I just don't know when. Maybe you could do it with Carter. Maybe you wait till he's right? old enough. I, you know, what do you think? Like seven, eight? Like he could probably pull it off then, right? For I don't sure. know. He's your kid, like five or yeah. six. It'll be fine. Okay, cool. <laughs> don't tell Jess I said that. <laughs> this well, is a podcast. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah. <laughs> so, Chris, saveonelife.net, um, getting back out in 2022, connecting with partners, connecting with community here in the US, making sure people know what you all are doing and how people can help support. Is there any final word, message, or call to action that you have for listeners related to Save One Life in 2022? Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the biggest programs of ours is the sponsorship program, and we're trying to grow it, like I said. Um, so there are kids in need of sponsors on our website. We have 185 on there right now. Um, mm. So we'd love people to check it out. And if you're able to sponsor, uh, please do. It's $420 a year, $35 a month. Um, but that that the funding is is really crucial for these families, helping them get transportation to the hospital, helping them stay in school, uh, helping them pay for some medical expenses if they have them. So um, it doesn't sound like a lot to us, but for those families, it's 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 li literally life changing. So um, if people can do that, that would be amazing. <laughs> So saveonelife.net, get involved, give what you can, do what you can. Chris, thank you for doing what you can, coming on here and sharing with us and the listeners. It's always a pleasure to see your face and we look forward to bringing you back on again soon. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Chris Bombardier and Save One Life. And thank you again to Caesar and the WFH for coming on, sharing a bit of their perspective on the global community at the start of this new year. Uh, SaveOneLife.net, uh, WFHWFHemophilia.org, or just type into Google, World Federation of Hemophilia, to learn more about either of those organizations. Um, Amy Board, as you know, as you know, because we worked together and we talked about this, and as you, like the listeners know, because it was literally said earlier on this podcast, next week we are going to uh, have a tribute episode to Val. So definitely check that out. Um, also, if you know people in the community who might really enjoy hearing that or benefit from that or, or, or might be craving some of that, like, like I am, 
uh, tell them about Bloodstream. This would be a good time to get them involved. That's one of the things that we can we can do here is in the moment like this, create the opportunity for community to connect around an individual who's no longer with us like Val. So that'll be next week, uh, next Friday on the 21st. And then the following Friday on our regularly scheduled episode. Uh, I like that we're in month one, week three already, like an <laughs> unscheduled, non-regular, yeah. Uh, but anyway, the Starting 20- the year off with a bang. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah Watson, as Amy mentioned, uh, between the two interviews, the new co-host of Flow, Bleeding Disorders community member, and licensed sex therapist, she is joining Jessica Lauren Richmond on Flow this season. Christy Van Horn will also still be a part of the show, though she will not be in that co-hosting capacity. So I uh, do want to give her her flowers and let you know she will still be around just in a different <laughs> capacity. So 28th with Sarah. We'll also have an expert on uh, to talk about that trial data from Biomarin's Valrox Gene Therapy Clinical Trial what does it mean? What to look for? And of course, if there's anything between now and then that also emerges of relevance to gene therapy clinical trial data, we'll get their take on that as well. So all of that's coming up on the rest of this month here on Bloodstream. And now that I got through all of that, that is all for this episode. Reminder to subscribe to the Bloodstream Podcast wherever you listen, to share this episode with friends, family, colleagues, strangers, anyone you want, really. You could share with anybody. <laughs> And Amy and I will be back next week with another episode in your podcast feed. Hey, and remember, you can always email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com. If you have a bleeding disorder or health topic you'd like to hear us uh, discuss a little bit more, or if you have an expert or a guest that you're dying to hear from. Uh, if you'd like to inquire about storytelling and casting opportunities for Bloodstream's podcast or Believe Limited's films, which we have many coming we up here in 2022. Cool so stuff if you going are. On interested in sharing your story or maybe getting a little bit of the showbiz bug, please, again, email us at mailbag at bloodstreammedia.com or you can connect with us on social media. You can find Bloodstream Media on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or you can follow myself and, of course, Patrick James Lynch on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. I'm actually, I'm committed to LinkedIn. We're all you committed are. to LinkedIn. Find me on there if you, if you want to. It'll be great. It'll be fun and we can laugh about it. I get messages from her <laughs> on LinkedIn now. It's really like, it's just, it's, I beam with pride. And with that, I am your host, Patrick James Lynch. And I am that other host, Amy Board. Until next time, take self-care of yourself. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.